Hello everyone, it's time for another podcast today with Justin. Hello everyone. And we talk about luck in war, specifically where the Germans just lucky. And this came up when I posted the why the US was small at Sabo Island. And there was a comment hit that noted the Japanese had an almost suicidally risky plan that was lucky enough to succeed, kind of like the Germans against France in 1940. It wasn't US or French incompetence as much as the Japanese and Germans getting really lucky. First off, two definitions for luck. The one I pulled from Google was success or failure apparently brought by chance rather than through one's own actions. This is one way to look at it and I personally, especially in military affairs, see luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I like that second definition a lot a lot better than I mean the, the first definition is quite literally and I think that's the way a lot of people will think of it but preparation meets opportunity is probably going to be a central theme of of this chat I think yeah and and I have a simple example to illustrate that so let's say you have a, a squad or a platoon or, or something in between from the size and you move into a new position and you don't expect any enemy to show up and for some reason an enemy patrol a four man stumbles out of the woods. They are lost or something. We don't know. It happens all the time. So now we have four situations. The first, we have untrained troops. The second, we've trained. The third, we experience. And the fourth, we have crack troops. Or it could also be just their state of awareness at that moment. So depends. Okay, the first one is one of your untrained noobs spots the, the patrol overreacts, he doesn't cause out the target, does nothing, inform the order, he starts just shooting with his um, bolt action rifle, misses badly, the, the patrol is startled but immediately gets back into the woods. Nothing happens. So actually a lucky situation, but nothing happened. So second situation, you have trained troops. The noob also reacts rather fast this time, and, but he calls out the target. So a few orders react, they start all together shooting, they hit one or two guys, one is dead, one is wounded, but, most, but the others get away. The third one, the guy who spots them silently informs the other guys, the machine guns start, um, and then they, they start combined firing. So machine gun and, and rifles, and they kill the whole patrol, or they're at least all incapacitated. Okay, now the fourth situation. You have now the, the squad leader, platoon leader, whoever is in charge, and he says, okay, he makes a perfect plan or he acts accordingly by dashing, daring or suppressing them and he captures them all alive. So he can all question them ideally. The basic example is you, you are lucky because you run into an unprepared or a patrol runs into you. But as you can see from these four examples, it can turn out completely differently on the state of awareness of your troops, the training, what your leaders do or not do and everything. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that's like a, a theme that I think is going to run through a lot of our examples is that, I don't know, this might make some people angry, but a lot of the time when I see people just say, oh, it was luck, and then they move on, it's almost a, a lack of analysis. Like they haven't looked yeah. close enough at the different factors that are underlying it. I mean, we all live life. We know that like coincidences genuinely happen. But then there are also circumstances that can improve the likelihood of a good outcome, which is really, I think, what's most important and what histories, like, like good histories that dig down deep with their analysis, um, get to the bottom of. Um, is it's, instead of skimming along the surface saying, well, well, that was lucky, they look a little bit deeper at to why this played out the way it did. Yeah, and I, I mean, you can, you can the, the example I bought, you can make it way more simpler. There's, for instance, you walk down, I, I, it happened to me actually, a friend and I, we walked down the road and we're talking. Uh, I, was, I was mostly focused on talking and, and very fixated on something else. And, and he spotted a $10 bill. I, I walked across another temple, I think it was five euro, yeah. So lucky there is a five, a five euro bill on the ground. Me not seeing it is because I'm preoccupied with something else. And I mean, there's actually uh, some scientific studies done on luck and you can increase it. It's actually really one of my, my favorite books. It's uh, from Wiseman, The Luck Factor. can highly recommend this. It was a present. 
And another way is, and here's the other thing. If for one simple person, you have this awareness or trained or something else, depending, because also situational awareness is also a thing. Because if you're working in museums or events, you see sometimes people walking into your camera. Last time, somebody really almost ran into the camera. And this was outside the museum hours when I was talking in front of a tank. And I was like, you, you couldn't, this is, this is like, yeah, a complete weird scenario. Like just walking around like nothing is going on. And, and now you add on this a group of soldiers like a squad or a platoon or a whole army, a, a whole nation, a whole infrastructure. And then, then it's, it's pretty hard to say, okay, uh, these guys were just lucky. Okay, because you have now thousands tens of thousands or hundred thousands of people involved so the the preparation is very and training and doctrine and everything is way more important here in such a scenario now let's move on to a to a rather specific campaign the germans in france 1940 the battle of france and i bring up a, a quote and then let's see what justin has to add here in the Battle of France 1940, Luftwaffe fighter and Stucker units averaged an impressive four to six sorties a day, whereas the French Air Force fighters averaged only one per day. So how would you explain this with luck? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's when you start looking at these little details like that. I mean, that's crazy. That's a crazy statistic. Now, and I'm sure most of the audience is aware I'm not as well read on the ETO as I am on the Asia Pacific, I have still read my fair share of stuff. And I mean, that is a stunning number. Um, you're getting significantly more efficiency compared to what the French Air Force is able to put up in resistance, um, which is indicating, of course, some kind of gap in quality or other, and probably on top of other contextual factors for why this is the case. And therefore, you can go down all sorts of different avenues for well, why were their sortie rates so much higher within the French? Uh, or why were the French ones so low? Um, and you can start getting down into the reeds and getting actual conclusions out of this, whereas somebody could maybe look at that, um, not even at that statistic, they'd stay higher level and say, oh, the Luftwaffe was just lucky. Well, I mean, obviously there's a lot more going on in this campaign than they got lucky if they're having a sortie rates that are that significantly higher, and therefore that is that is something that deems, I would, th I would say, further study, just in this kind of example, um, which is really something I want to drive home, is that you need to dig deeper a lot of the time than just saying it was luck. There are some cases, um, and we'll get it to it a little bit later on, where it was legitimate coincidence. But it didn't necessarily like, like this is huge. This is big picture. This is the Luftwaffe versus <laughs> yeah, the French Air Force um, to say, oh, maybe the Luftwaffe was just lucky in France um, is, I think, doing a, dis a great disservice to the quality of the organization. And that's not to say the Luftwaffe was flawless, because as anyone will know, it's far from and, you know, Bismarck <laughs> can, probably, can yeah. uh, tear it apart all day long. Um but they also did some things right. Um, and in this case, I think in the Battle of France, I, the Luftwaffe performs quite well. So let, let's move to the next one. Never again in this campaign did such apocalyptic scenes occur as in the night of the 16th to 17th May on the road from Soleil Rechateau of Avanes. The, the, uh, the 5th Motorized infantry division was literally rolled over during sleep. Even German soldiers whose units followed this road a few hours later in the daylight was done. This was basically a rumble with, sips, uh, with parts of the 7th Panzer Division who, who in, in, the, in the night, I think, mauled this division. Yeah. I mean, this is just luck. <laughs> yeah, that's like this is another case where clearly the Germans are doing something right and or the French are doing something wrong. And it's just the Germans themselves are stunned by their own success. So it's not necessarily, oh, the Germans are just so lucky. It's just the Germans are doing something right, but they don't necessarily fully understand what they're doing, <laughs> is how I kind of interpret that quote. I mean, I mean here, here's the thing. Now, some people say, okay, the, the, the French were unprepared and everything else. Okay, fair enough. Good, good point. But um, from an upcoming interview, which will be with uh, Professor Neitzel, 
the Germans didn't do night attacks in 43 and 44, uh, in 43 limited and 44 and 45, yeah, basically none. And you know what? I, I read it um, in one of the regulations, you know, night attacks are too hard to do. You need very well-trained men. So, yeah, even if you caught the French unprepared during the night, it just doesn't work if your troops are not properly trained. You can't hold together your... You, you have your like a uh, detachment of your panzer division in enemy territory during the night. This is not, they will not just wipe out an, en an enemy division just because they are there. It's not, that's not how war or an anything else works. It's, it's like, okay, you're behind enemy lines. On a, uh, it, it, it might work on some, some grand strategy games so immediately if you move a division behind the enemy line or something, the other division disappears. But that's not how it happens in real life. No, that's a great point, actually. And it, it reminds me of something I just read in Ian, uh, Ian Toll's book, um, Twilight of the Gods, it's kind of about the latter part of the um, Pacific War. And he's talking about at Iwo Jima, there was a night attack by the U.S. Marines. And um, he said it was, I think, the first night attack conducted by U.S. Marines during the war. Like, they just didn't, it was not something that they really trained hard in or emphasized, um, which is, by the way, the exact opposite of the Japanese army. The Japanese army was huge in night attacks, um, stretching back years. But, I mean, this is the U.S. Marine Corps pretty much at its peak, and there were still problems with their night attack because they weren't that used to conducting attacks at night. Um, so they basically misunderstood. They were trying to capture a heavily fortified fill, a hill or a rise on Iwo Jima. and they decided to try to do it by night, which is reasonable because the defenses are very heavy. Um, but in the night, they end up misjudging what hill they needed to take. So they, in, come morning, they realized that they had done all of this night fighting, and then they were actually one hill short of the hill they needed to take. So then they had to finish the job with heavy casualties in daylight um, because they had misjudged the where they were at night. I mean, this is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of an interesting parallel there. So the, the next quote will be, while all of the German tank was concentrated in the attack zone in Belgium and the Ardennes, the French army had several of its field armies in Lorraine, Alsace, and the Italian frontier. In total, about 885 tanks or over a quarter of its tank force was deployed away from the main battle zone. Now one could argue, well, the Germans were lucky that the French made this mistake. Yeah, that's, and, and, and of course, then you could go, well, I mean, obviously, there's doctrinal baggage that goes along with this that you can look into for why the tanks are deployed the way they are. And I mean, I know this is one of the most, I think, common, commonly known highlights from the French campaign is how they disperse their tanks or anything. I'm not going to speak authoritatively on that. I'm I'm more of a plane and boat guy. But yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a lot more that you can look into there instead of just saying, oh, well, that's lucky, because of course, it's not luck. There's a reason why the French were deploying their tanks that way. <laughs> Um, right or wrong, that needs exploration. And also the Germans need the proper skills to move to the Ardennes because why everyone thought you can't move tanks or a large amount of troops through the Ardennes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there must be a reason for this. So they, they must have either been skilled enough or do something else to achieve it in the first place. Now the final quote that's related to that. The decisive cause for the German success in the battle against French tanks was the fact that the French always fought against the regiment only with a small number of tanks. Therefore, it was possible to destroy them with the concentrated fire of our relatively few armor-defeating weapons. It could lead to a very difficult situation if the French employed a large number of Sumo Oma tanks against us. So this was an experience report, I think, of a colonel. Yeah, and again, I mean, uh, this will go back into just how the French were employing tanks, the types of tanks they had why their production figures were the way they were, why they were employing the tanks the way they were, why the Germans had their tanks concentrated in the first place. Um, so in other words, you're, you could again immediately look at both sides and you can go back stretching years, if not over a decade, see why the Germans were organized the way they were, the French were organized the way they were, and the strengths or weaknesses of those two organizations. Yeah, and, and if you look and if you just uh, do it down to, lu to, to luck, you, know, you have now the situation, the French have a few tanks, but which are well armored. And then you have the Germans come with a, with a larger force of tanks, but most of them can't penetrate the French tanks. 
So now, if the Germans are not properly trained, coordinated and don't have proper discipline, the first few tanks fire, see the, the shots bounce off, they panic, retreat, make something stupid. While if the French are well skilled at everything, they shoot up the German tanks one after another. So if you just say, okay, they were, they were lucky because they, they deployed in high numbers. Also, if you look at my Panzer Grenadier commandments, there's a very important, these are 30, and one is, or I think several are actually all focused on the march because they note it's very important for a march that you don't arrive, that you arrive together, that the whole unit arrives, that you don't arrive in piecemeal. And the Germans stretch this point for a very good reason. So this is also the thing, just, just arriving with the whole regiment and facing the enemy who is own, has only a platoon or a company is already a feat in itself. You, it's, it's, it, this is not a computer game where you, okay, you always deploy 100% of your troops because nothing breaks down or something. Or you don't have stragglers or somebody is lost on the map and everything. This is what, what people forget. We are talking about a huge machine working here. There are so many cogs there. And if one fails, it, it can break up something else. I mean, and I actually... And I might be wrong here, but, but you are the neighbor, you are more aware of the neighbor. There are things, I think, typically, uh, the one typical example I know, or two typical examples, where luck was very important, I think, is the Bismarck against the hood. The first is the Bismarck hitting the hood that it basically blows up. And the second one is the swordfish is hitting the Bismarck on that spot that the Bismarck can't maneuver anymore or can't maneuver properly. These are things where I say, okay, these are really lucky incidents. But then again, I think the Bismarck made, broke radio silence at one point. So one could, but I'm not sure if this was before or after the, the aspect. So, so I'm not completely aware about the whole campaign. But like, would, would you, I mean, this is where I would argue this is luck. The hood getting blown up with one hit. Well, uh, one or a few several salvos. To play, I guess to play devil's advocate for a second, um, you could say that the fact that Bismarck was able to get on target uh, against the hood as quickly as it did was a testament to the training of the crews and the capability of their fire control system. There's obviously an element of probability because you can really, the, the most your fire control system can do is get your dispersion ellipse on the target, um, what we call a straddle. And then at that point, it's pretty much just a numbers game of the size of your dispersion ellipse and just probability for a shell to eventually hit the target. And then, of course, in the case of the hood, they hit the target in such a way, and I know it's heavily debated as to how, where it penetrated or whatever. Personally, I really don't care. Um, but the fact of the matter is they hit something really important. It led to what was probably a cordite, ex uh, cordite explosion, and the ship was destroyed. Just as easily, Hood could have been pummeled for, you know, 45 minutes and just taken all these shell hits and not sustained such a lethal hit. I um, mean, that's kind of the nature of, of naval warfare. It's always why it's part of the one of one reason of 500 million why I always chuckle at those like contextless versus arguments is, <laughs> is it's like, well, what if Iowa and, and, and Yamato, they engaged? And it's like, okay, well, that fight could go 25,000 different ways, just depending on the probability of circumstances. You know, you could, you could argue for hours about the merits of radar-directed fire control, and then the first salvo from the secondaries on Yamato destroys the radar in Iowa. And suddenly, all of that debating was pointless. Or vice versa, the Iowa hits something absolutely critical on Yamato, it knocks out all this fire control or kills the entire command staff on Yamato or whatever. And it, the entire dynamic of the the engagement is completely different now. And, and, and it's like that for, particularly for naval combat. I mean, it happens in air combat or, or land combat as well. There's always this element of probability, but then you can explain certain things. Like, you know, going back to Bismarck and Hood, the dispersion ellipse on Bismarck's guns. You can start getting into that kind of really technical stuff. It's like, well, Bismarck would have a higher probability than probably a comparable weapon in the Italian uh, region marina because of their shell quality issues, um, where usually they would lead to some very excessive dispersion patterns. 
you could start getting into all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the Bismarck got on target and it ended up destroying the target. And there is an element of probability or luck, you could say, but also there's an element of, well, they got it on target quickly in the first place. And then I guess like going on with the swordfish as well, there's an element of luck. There's like a, a chain of events that leads up to it that's less than luck. It's it's more like, because I'm pretty sure if I remember right, the, the radio broadcast you mentioned was before it was how they were able to find Bismarck again, yeah, if I recall correctly. Um so that's obviously not necessarily luck. It's just you could say it's an error on on the German part, or you could describe it in any manner of ways. And then, of course, the swordfish to come in there. I mean, they ultimately have to hit this battleship with a torpedo, which takes and training. also find it, find and it. Find it. Yeah. I mean, um, you, you have like midway and everything, and I think they had clear skies there, and I think the Atlantic is a bit more nasty. Yeah, and yeah. If evening. I I could be wrong, but if I remember right, the weather was not very good for carrier yeah. operations when they were hunting the Bismarck. So I mean, they're they're up there in the in this little swordfish. They're probably getting buffeted around by weather. They have to attack against heavy AA fire. There's all this stuff going on. So at the end of the day, it, it's almost slightly insulting when people are like, "Oh, it was all luck." It's like, well, it wasn't necessarily. I mean, not every air crew in the world would have been able to hit a moving target like that under those circumstances. I mean, there's there's training and there's lead up to this end result. And yes, there might be probability or coincidence or whatever at play to a certain degree, but ultimately if you had like a terribly trained crew, like some late war Japanese crew that has 60 flight hours and can barely fly their plane, they're probably not torpedoing the Bismarck in, in heavy seas <laughs> and awful weather. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents there. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So to sum it up, I would say, for, for most, especially for land armies, to argue, yeah, they were just lucky, I, I would highly disagree. You have it even on the, on the, on the personal level already. I mean, I, I made the personal example with Monocosilla in my, with, with Rice in one of my videos before. But then when it comes to like really big ships and really big guns, their luck can be a decisive factor in some situations. But then again, just luck won't win the day usually because, well, you can't run, you can't build a ship, train a crew, move into the area of operations and then come back with just luck and also hit the enemy. It's, it's, that doesn't work, guys. So, well, thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, always a pleasure being here. And thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.